Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on how to get hired with Sightline Media. Um, today, we have Davis Winky of Military Times, um, Mike Gruss, who is the editor in chief of Sightline, and Andrea Scott of Marine Corps Times here to speak with you guys. So, Mike or Davis, you guys can go ahead. Sure, I'll kick it off. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining and thanks for taking time out of your evening to do this. Um, Thanks again to Devin and, and Davis for setting this up. I think it'll be uh, somewhat fun and informative on a Thursday night. Um, I think we're, you know, what we're, we want to make sure we leave time for questions, but um, what I think what we're going to do is, is talk a little bit about Sightline and what we do, but then also um, kind of talent development and, and benefits in the office, and then kind of some positions we're hiring for, and, and also our our fellowship program and um, at the same time kind of I think give give some advice or some tips on on what we look for um, when we're hiring and, and I'll kind of start by just saying um, we've done a lot of hiring in the last uh, the last year or so I think it's been um, it's been a, a pretty volatile time within the defense press in part because there are a lot of, um, to use like a military acquisition term, new entrants. <laughs> like there's a lot of uh, competition within the, the defense space. And as places have at reporting positions, I think naturally they've looked for experience. So I was trying to count, I think in the last year, um, I've been part of 13, hires and then a couple fellows so um that's a lot and but it's it's you know people say it's the most important thing you do and that's that's arguably true we take it very very seriously and that's why we're doing events like this tonight so um i wanted to start just by talking a little bit about our our newsroom organization um we're kind of divided up uh into four main desks and then and then uh, uh or or with two additional teams. Um, and I'll just talk quickly about what they do. And then um, Andrea and, and Davis can chip in. But um, the first is kind of our, our breaking news or rapid response desk. And that is uh, a team that's, um, it does some of our, what are considered kind of purple stories, stories that go um, across all of our brands and across um, all of the services, but also what we, the, the goal is really to get as many to, to try and get, to make sure that we have every story that, that our readers want and that we're, we're, we're staying up to date on what's breaking. And when we need something fast, we can, we can turn to this team and get something up in 30 minutes or an hour. And um, maybe it's not the, the full fleshed out version that we would have otherwise, but um, it's a start and it gets people kind of coming back to the site over and over again. We also have um, a military services team that includes um, Army Times, Marine Corps Times, Navy Times, Air Force Times. Um, and I think that's maybe uh, traditionally what people think of when when they think of uh, military times, but it's that that day to day reporting and enterprise um, on the services and that it's it's geared toward troops and veterans and their families. Uh, we have Defense News, which is our kind of business of defense uh, flagship. It's it's written for or toward um, the, the defense acquisition officials and, and geared toward uh, the defense industry, but um, they focus primarily on on what uh, what the big dollars programs how they're being how they're playing out what kind of accountability we can provide for those programs and um, you know, kind of where they are in the acquisition cycle. And then we also have our emerging markets desk, which covers C4, ISRnet, and Federal Times. Federal Times is a little bit of an outlier from the rest of our audience that it's, um, it's a publication that's been around a very long time. It focuses on, uh, on federal employees and kind of workforce issues that they have. And then C4, ISRnet, um, it's a little bit of a, of a mouthful, but it, it, uh, it tackles kind of the, the business and industry aspect of emerging technology. There's um, one other team, and then I'll let Andrea chip in about our, our video team, but then we also have a, a custom content team that helps with some of maybe our custom webcasts or our 
white papers that we might work on with uh, sponsors or um, you know, just making sure that we are packaging our, our stories in the right way so that, um, that folks uh, in the advertising community maybe have an understanding of what's coming and they're saying like, hey, that might be something that we want to be a part of. So um, I think those are the five, five teams. And Andrea, do you want to kick it off and, and talk a little bit about our video team? Sure. Can you hear me? Um, sorry, I'm in a parking lot right now, but yeah. I was really excited to be here tonight. So I apologize for the background, but um, it's nice to meet you all. So I am the editor of Marine Corps Times. So I've been working in that kind of military times silo. We're not siloed, but just for understanding, right, um, in that channel. Um, I've been there about six years now, and I absolutely love it. But I also help host Defense News Weekly, which used to just be um, a defense news TV show that, you know, that channel, but now we do some military content as well. So it is a 30 minute show that is um, four times over the weekend on AFN, which is um, American Forces Network. If any of you we're living on base, you know, perhaps overseas or here in the States that that would have been one of the channels that you got. So we are on, you know, the base television with that half hour show doing just the top military and defense news each week. So we have a video team um, that goes out and shoots. And um, we also, you know, due to the pandemic have gotten much better at Zoom and other opportunities for our reporters. So it doesn't always have to be um, in our studio. We do have um, a TV studio at our WeWork in Boston, um, which we sometimes have people in, or sometimes we do um, calls remotely. So um, yeah, and it also goes online and on our channels on social media, you know, that's part of the beauty of the world that we live in is we can repurpose our content and share it across all our brands. So was there anything else or just specifically video, Mike? Sure, or anything you wanted to add about uh, Marine Corps Times or Davis, if you wanted sure. to, to chip in a little bit too. Sure, I'll just say about um, Military Times maybe, just to give a little more explanation of that. So there is a service publication for each, um, you know, each service, each brand. So we have Marine Corps Times, Navy Times, Army Times, Air Force Times. We do not have Coast Guard Times. Um, we kind of have some Space Force. <laughs> content, um, but no publication for that yet. And we are still a print publication, which is one of my favorite parts of working here. You know, there are a lot of military outlets, um, but I think ours is probably the most robust in that we have individual teams for each service, right? So some of our competitors, maybe military.com, um, Stars and Stripes is the government um, funded publication that you may know, they don't necessarily have a whole team that's able to cover the Marine Corps or a whole team that's able to cover the Navy. And while we have small teams, I do think that because we're able to really focus, you know, on the individual service, we can really get a lot deeper in our reporting, which is something that I'm really proud of and, and really enjoy about the way that we're set up. So um, we have a monthly magazine in print, which is still, you know, sold in um, the the exchanges on base, the commissaries, and um, but we are a web first publication. So, you know, our stories, we don't always hold them for print. Sometimes we do if it's a cover story, for example, but we are thinking about getting our content online quickly on social media. Um, and yeah, I think the main difference between us and some of the other publications, so Defense News, for example, they're going to focus a lot on like the acquisition side, on the defense companies that are running you know, if we're talking about the American, I'm sorry, the um, amphibious combat vehicle, the ACV, um, they may be looking at, you know, the money or who, who's building that, where we're really looking at the service member side. So how is this going to affect the individual Marines? How is this going to affect, you know, these battalions? How is this going to change the culture of the Marine Corps? So we really want to look at the service um, specific side and be, um, you know, a source of news that service members themselves can really relate to. Davis, I will throw it to you. Yeah, I'll add on and say that the way that our different teams are structured and have different expertise cultivated in different lanes where you've got the people with the military service brands aiming, you know, towards their audience. Uh, I like to say the spiritual audience of Army Times is some E4 with a maroon beret sticking out of his pocket walking by the North PX newsstand at Fort Bragg. 
Um, but the way that the way that this company is structured and has people focused on all the different parts of the defense enterprise really allows for some unique collaborations where, you know, I'm able to partner up with the cyber warfare reporter over at C4 and, you know, write about issues that the Army is having with IT modernization and both have the, the big contract picture of why something might be going down and then also bring in, you know, how is this affecting soldiers at the lowest level? Um, it's a scale that um, no other national security or defense focused newsroom can match. And I've, I've really enjoyed every second of being able to get after more angles of important issues. Good, and, and Davis, do you wanna kick off the, the kind of the next section here when we're talking about um, you know, talent development? I think that there's, you're kind of a natural place to start there. Yeah, uh, if you could go next slide, please. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Devin. Um, yeah, in terms of in terms of talent development, um, SMG is one of these newsrooms where you're going to see people pursue careers the way that they used to be done in this industry, where somebody can fight their way in at the lowest level. And as you know, different personnel movements or restructurings happen along the way, start to climb their way up the ladder and you know, grow in responsibility, grow in position, um, and, and have all kinds of opportunities along the way. Um, one of the most interesting parts of this is how many veterans we have on staff who actually started as interns. Um, so my editor, Kyle Remfer, who's the, he's the Army Times editor, he started as an intern, then moved on to the Early Bird Brief, which is uh, the flagship newsletter for, for the company, then came over and was the Army Times senior reporter, and after that became the Army Times editor. Um, I joined as a intern fellow deal um, in late 2020, referred through MVJ. And um, in May of last year, I moved up to take the permanent role as the senior reporter for Army Times when Kyle was promoted to be the editor. And then we've got another reporter right now, Rachel Nostrand, who's our early bird brief editor, who she is a you know, Marine veteran who started as an intern but because she was the person with the right skill set and the right experience and the right place at the right time, you know, she's managed to see her responsibilities grow rapidly. So there's, there's definitely a lot of room for career growth within the company that kind of breaks the usual mold you see in the DC based media where people are hopping around jobs every two years um, just to get the next you know, lateral or diagonal move. Um, we're able to, because of the scale of this newsroom, we're able to take care of a lot of that internally. Um, and then in addition to that, there's um, been, been a push in recent, in recent years for increased newsroom training opportunities. We've brought in trainers from IRE uh, to train us on on you know how to better do our FOIAs, how to how to better track them. Um, there's been you know there's been other training events such as how to do do video shoots as reporters. You know because those of us who are working online in print, um, you know, don't always speak straight to camera. Uh, not all of us do what Andrea does. Um, and then beyond that too, there's also opportunities for individual training. Um, I've got fully funded travel to go attend a um, IRE data journalism boot camp in August in Missouri um, that I can see Mike running the budget again in his head right now. Um, and um, but but those kinds of opportunities are there both to kind of bring talent in, develop it while it's here and give it opportunities to keep climbing and keep contributing within this newsroom. Mike, if you had anything else on that? Yeah, no, I, I think you kind of hit it on that. And what I would just add is that, um, you know, our, our goal is to get, you know, as, as journalists is, is to get better every story. And, and you know, I, I love the saying when people say like, well, what's your, what's your best story? And you say, well, my next one. 
And um, I think, you know, we, we take that, we take that seriously. We offer, you know, Davis mentioned some of the in-house training we've done. You know, I would also point to, you know, uh, sessions we did on leads and nut graphs, which um, are fundamental. And uh, to me, it was uh, a great lesson in how we can sharpen our work. Uh, some of the editors earlier this year went through a, um, a session on how to enter, how to better edit enterprise reporting, um, kind of those longer or, or more in-depth pieces that um, are really aimed at making a difference and uh, not necessarily just breaking news. So um, you mentioned video FOIA. I think we we did one last year on how to read uh, how to read the defense budget, which is you know a, a monstrosity. Um, so I, th I think there's a lot there, but um, I also think you know what we're trying to instill within all of our editors is a culture of um, continuous feedback, and that that you know, hey, here's why this didn't work in a story. Here's why this did. And then you know you know that you're getting you know that you're getting better and you know that hey a story I wrote six months ago I might not write the same way today because I know I know some of the mistakes I made or some of the the ways I could could polish this even more or be even more sophisticated and more nuanced in my reporting and writing so I think I think that's kind of how we're approaching it and um, you know I, I I like to think it's working and I think uh, you know the way I would measure that is, is in part. By we have seen we have been able to to promote from within for some positions and you know my hope is to as things open up moving forward that we're able to to continue doing that and you know to Davis's point about outside training I think that's um, something we're 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 doing now not a ton of it but we are and we're looking to do you know I think when when we find the right training for the right person then that's something where where we're willing to invest and say like this this is a way for this person to get better and it's a way for our whole newsroom to get better and um, I think uh, I'm looking forward to seeing seeing more of it in, in the future. Um, all right, so let me um, let me run through a couple other points here I know. Um, Davis said hey let's talk about benefits and pay so <laughs> that's that's always one of the fun ones right. Um, I think uh, you know. I, I think our, our our benefits are are probably good. That we offer, I, I think, the same types of benefits that, that many other places offer. We have uh, a pretty good healthcare plan, a four hundred one k, but um, no match right now. Um, three weeks of vacation for everyone, um, and that moves that uh, escalates the longer you've been here. I think after two years, they you get a couple extra days, and then it goes on. I would also say that that. The culture we are trying to build in the newsroom is that we recognize that journalism is not a clock in clock out nine to five job and so that there are some flexible hours there and it's not like hey i need to go to a doctor's appointment i need to put in for pto that's it's not kind of the way we operate um i would say our pay is um it's close to it's pretty close if not better based on an, an individual person you know um, where we are with some of our competitors, you know, um, I'd say, you know, kind of right out of school, absolutely no experience, um, you know, other than internships, we're probably looking to start in the 50s. But then, you know, I think there are, I think we've rewarded people who have done good work. And um, I guess the other thing I would point out is that we also have done for the last six quarters, I think we've done a quarterly bonus. It's, it's not quite a, a revenue share, but um, we have met um, some revenue goals and we've met editorial and production goals. And so um, that's been part of it too. So I, I know that's pretty vague, but um, you know, I'm happy to answer any more uh, specific questions as they, as they come up. Um, so let me, uh, let me chat for a minute about a couple of positions we're hiring for, and then we can kind of go through also, um, you know, you guys tell me how fast we can go. And then I, I have a couple kind of like tips on things we've seen in resumes and um, items that kind of sometimes get lost in, in transition. But, um, you know, right now, I think we're, we're focusing on a couple of positions. One, um, Andrew, do you want to start with the, uh, the Marine Corps Times 
senior reporter. Sure, yeah. And back to um, just kind of the training and, and development, I would just say a pitch to you guys as veterans. We are just so grateful to have so many veterans in our newsroom. Um, just a little bit about me. My family, um, both my brothers are in the Air Force. My father was in the Air Force. I come from you know a long line of military family. I didn't join the military because I didn't know there were other jobs besides pilots. I kind of regret <laughs> that. Um, but I think I think that veterans, especially, there's a really unique role for you in journalism. And I think especially covering military, you know, um, um, I'll just tell you this little anecdote. I don't know if I should, but I will. When I got hired, you know, they said, you have the best reporting experience um, of anyone who's applied, but you don't have any military reporting. And I was like, oh, you know, my dad was an A-10 pilot. And they're like, oh, you're fine. And it's because they knew I grew up, you know, in a military family on base, having conversations, knowing how to talk to service members. And that's something that we really value. And that's something that can really elevate your reporting, right? Like your experience as veterans, um, you have knowledge about about acronyms that other journalists might not necessarily have, you know? So it's been really been a blessing for me as an editor to work with. Um, the senior reporter for Marine Corps Times, the previous two since I've been an editor have both actually been Marine veterans. You don't have to be a Marine veteran. You don't even have to be a veteran. Um, we've had plenty of good candidates who are not veterans, but um, it has been an interesting match of, you know, kind of me bringing my journalism background and them bringing their military background, trying to learn journalism. And it's been, you know, a really good, um, fit. So as far as Marine Corps Times, um, we are a smaller publication, as you might imagine, being a smaller branch. So we have um, one and a half full-time um, staff members covering Marine Corps content. And I just want to explain quickly, we have a whole separate team, which is our purple team, which some of these openings they might mention would talk about that, which will cover, you know, stuff in the Pentagon that'll affect the Marine Corps, but also the Air Force and also the Navy. Um, so this is actually focusing specifically on Marine coverage um, and kind of leading that. I think this is a really exciting position. It is a beat reporter position. You know, there is um, not anything necessarily that's totally off limits if it hits the caliber of our news judgment and has a Marine angle, right? Or even Marine family or Marine veteran. Um, we really get to talk about everything from culture to gear, you know, to what's happening on base, to what the junior, you know, service members are upset about, to the general that was fired, et cetera. So um, there really is that breadth of content. Um, and it's also, I, I think what's exciting about it is there's a lot of opportunities for different kinds of writing, right? So sometimes there has to be those quick turn pieces, something awful happened, someone was fired, you know, a Marine um, uh, AAV sunk and, and we need those quick turn stories. But then we have time to turn and okay, let's do, you know, an enterprise look, let's get that investigation for the AAV sinking. Um, let's talk to the families, let's, let's really get the depth and do, you know, that enterprise um, coverage that might be our cover story for one of our magazines, etc. So this person would be kind of leading the charge in all of that and working with me on a day to day basis to say, okay, like, how do we navigate what is going on in the Marine Corps, as well as, you know, Davis was saying about FOIAs, how do we kind of create some of our own coverage by asking questions and seeing what's there? Um, and so it's really a balance of, of covering that. So one thing I don't love, or I do love, I'm sorry, <laughs> what I love about is that we don't have quotas, there's no daily story limit, but you can kind of tell, like, I want us to be the spot that everyone who wants Marine news is going. So if there's something that's happening in the Marine Corps that rises to that level, we wanna be covering it. So um, like I said, sometimes that's a quick turn piece. Maybe that's a quick turn piece, one or two a day, but then you know, you're working on maybe a longer story a week. We do usually have that Marine cover story every month back to the one and a half. I never finished explaining that. Um, we do have a reporter who is um, half Marine Corps times, half Army times, and he's also been picking up some editing, um, some editing back to that talent development. He's wanted to kind of rise himself as an editor, and he's also doing a segment for the new show uh, now called Mill Tech because he really likes tech. He's a Marine veteran. Um, so he does um, some Marine Corps content, but that's not his full-time position. So this position specifically would be that beat reporter for the Marine Corps um, and working you know, with our internship team, with me who writes when I can and working with Todd to really make sure we're covering everything happening in the Marine Corps. 
And and I'll also chime in really quick and add that, you know, there's there's collaboration between the service brands as well. What what Andrea brought up about the AAV sinkings um, and, you know, just tactical vehicle accidents in general. Um, the the former uh, senior reporter for working for Andrea, he and I co bylined a story about a government accountability office report on uh, tactical vehicle rollover crash deaths. Um, that that ended up um, helping make sure that focus and heat stayed on that issue. Um, and we're still seeing results of those investigations and the, the reporting on them play out today with the Army recently announcing that it's re redoing the way it trains drivers. So, you know, even, even though it's a Marine specific beat job, we find ways to, to work together in order to, you know, tackle issues that affect you know you know all the services or um you know just just because we we want to have a bigger story and uh each pitch in half the effort it would usually take to get there right um davis don't think i didn't see your comment here about filing i'll get back to you later on that no, I'm just <laughs> but um I think the other the other job that, that there's a couple other positions we've opened right now. Um, one is a, a reporter on our rapid response team that that Andrea touched on, um, and I think that's to kind of move first on on some of the breaking news, some of the purple stories, some of the um, the pieces that that in the morning it's like oh we wish we had that um, maybe we can maybe we can aggregate uh, a piece maybe we can think differently about um another angle but um really the goal there is to make sure that we're providing the 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 community our community of readers everything they need so they feel like um that that they're getting um they can make the best decisions about their life and, the, and their job throughout the day and so those the military times the rapid response reporter those those folks would probably write more stories um if everything's working as planned probably um again we don't have a quota but i would say they're writing at least one story a day um but maybe more and it's their, those stories are maybe uh maybe more in the 400 to 600 word range but i think we've seen um from some of the folks who've had those jobs that they can there that when you do your time management right um you can you can do some pretty strong enterprise and i think we've seen that um some some compelling profiles some really good uh issue stories and um it's uh it's a demanding job but i think it's a, a great way in in to kind of flex and say like hey here's here's how i know where the stories are and and to write quickly and um and to really make a a, a name for yourself and then the other positions we have open, we have two right now on our custom team, which I talked about earlier. Those are kind of like um, a hybrid form of journalism. It's working, you know, some with our marketing and advertising department, but also working with um, the editorial team. It could be helping to plan events. It could be, like I said, packaging, writing abstracts to help package some of our stories. So we say, hey, we know we're going to be at AUSA uh, this year. What are some what are some of the ways that we can think about some events we might want to hold around AUSA, or um, what kind of stories are we are we going to be sure that we're going to have? So um, I think of those as a lot of planning, particularly with um, military times right now. They're doing a lot of our education and transition coverage, which um, has gotten I think um, I think it's always been good. I think it's gotten even better the last couple months just because we've been able to supplement some of the, the coverage into to maybe some unique pieces that um, wouldn't, we wouldn't ordinarily be thinking about or maybe or, wouldn't ordinarily make time for. And Andrea, help me out here. Christine Froba has written many of those recently and she was a former intern as well, correct? Former fellow, yep. So um, a lot there. And then I think the other part, the, the second one of those jobs um, on the custom team is probably a little bit more of a project manager role to help us keep organized, but um, still requires some good writing and editing chops um, for some of the white papers and, and the ebooks that that we produce. So um, I know we've kind of talked a lot. I did want to just touch on a couple tips that I had of things 
um, that uh, that I've noticed, you know, over the years when we've been hiring. Um, one I would say is that, like lots of places, we use uh, we use an automated system for for hiring. It, ours is called Greenhouse, and I, I bring that up only because um, for candidates, it's sometimes easy to get lost. Um, these systems are systems and they're they're you know they're not perfect so i would say it's important to to, fi to apply uh, for a job through there but also to email individual editors and i think all of our i know everyone on this call our information is very easy to find but i think our staff pages are are up to date and it's easy to find an editor who you're looking for um you know i the other point i would bring up with that is that um, you know, if you have a PDF of your resume, and more importantly, if you have a PDF of your clips, um, it's important to upload those. Um, sometimes links get lost or broken, or they don't carry over because they're being copied and pasted into a system. So I think if you had, can offer a PDF, that makes it um, a little bit of a smoother process and it guarantees we we see what we're looking for. Otherwise, and this is this is never what a reporter wants, you can um you google someone's name and you're like oh well what's the last thing they write and that might not be the story you're most proud of or the story that you want um us to see as a clip so um that's why i think it's important to to bring those up um i i will say uh i've worked particularly hard in the last year on our job descriptions and i know when andrea just posted her job description she worked even harder on it and so I would say, um, take some time to read those job descriptions that we take them very seriously. And that um, I think there are, uh, I don't wanna say clues, but I think there's a lot of language in there that makes it clear kind of like what we're looking for and what types of, what our values are and what types of people um, we think will succeed in our organization. And so, um, I know people have basic, like, I know some people have, you know, almost like regurgitated some of those clauses back to me in cover letters. And it's like, yeah, well, you know what? You got my attention now and like that works, but I know that you read the job description and took it seriously. And so um, I think that's good. Uh, and then the last thing, um, the last thing I would point out there is uh, to have a cover letter. I, I, I know it's, um, I know cover letters are painful and sometimes um, no fun to write. To me, they show that you're taking the application process seriously, that you've learned our names. Um, I can't tell you the number of applications that I get for Defense One or um, one of our other competitors where they get the name wrong and it's like, oh, I'm applying to military.com. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> so it's important to get all those details right and um, to show that you've read our publication and that you know the types of, of stories we we cover and the last thing i would just say is that we um i'm a big i'm a i'm a huge believer in show don't tell in our journalism and so i think in a cover letter if it's not um or a resume it's not important to just say i held this job i did this job but um to show how you did it even better than someone else. I, I joke about it sometimes in the newsroom as like a journalism above replacement, that if we were to send 100 reporters to do this story, how would yours be better? And so I, you know, I think when we have, um, you know, I think when we have that type of thinking and you can show, hey, here's how, here's how I stand out, here's how I do, here's how I think differently, here's how I get ahead of the competition, it's, um, it makes us even more, it makes us want to talk to you even more. So I, I think that I'll kind of stop there, but Davis and Andrew, do you guys want to add on to that? Sorry about that. I was, uh, I was dropping um, the, the link to the job board in the chat so you can gaze upon these well-groomed and meticulous job descriptions. Um, if if I had to add anything, um, it would be find a way to articulate whether it's in a, a cover letter, whether it's in 
a email to the hiring editor about, you know, this is just flagging that you've applied or something like that, you know, find a way to succinctly articulate what you bring to the table that somebody else doesn't. You know, if you are, you know, say a Marine Corps reservist or something like that, and are really familiar, just generally speaking with with what, what the Corps has looked like in recent years, or if, you know, you've got your DD-214 in hand and you just got out in the last couple of years, you know, feel free to play up like how recent and current your knowledge of, of the culture and the way, you know, the way that things work in the Marine Corps. Um, and feel free to play that stuff up when you're selling yourself to be, you know, the, the senior reporter for a place like Marine Corps Pines. You know, each of us has different things that make us, you know, potentially more suited for, for each job. And, and don't, don't be shy to put something on the table and be like, here's why I am the best fit and will bring something to the table that somebody else won't. And then be prepared to explain it should you progress to an interview. Yeah, I think you guys covered it pretty well. Um, should we go to some question and answers and see what we can talk about there? There's one more slide on the... Oh, sure. Um, the fellowship program? Sure, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so right now we are, um, and I see there's a couple questions, so we'll, we'll try and get to those. Um, right now we are, we kind of have, kicked off our um, fellowship program again. We just um, we kind of wanted to make sure it was serving everyone and took a few months off, but uh, you know, we're just starting it up again this month. We feel pretty strongly that it will work and that it's, that it's in a good place. Um, there are, there is a job description on, um, on the site right now for our fellowship program. I think we're, we're thinking of it right now as 12 week, uh, as a 12 week program with the possibility of it being extended. Um, it's working, you know, one of the things we've worked hard on is that it is now a 40 hour a week program. Um, this year we're paying $20 an hour. So that's a pretty competitive um, rate for a newsroom internship. Um, you know, I, the timeline, like I said, it's kind of rolling. And so as folks have been coming in, we've, you know, we've been talking to them, um, you know, uh, I'd say some weeks are busier than others, but I think for this job, we expect people to work throughout the newsroom. That means on, um, you know, in working for Marine Corps Times or C4SRNet or both and, um, you know, working for Army Times, but, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not going to be, we want people to get uh, the full array of experiences. We expect that, um, that at the end of that time, that there should be several, you know, if the, if the fellowship is working right, that, that folks should have several clips by the end that they feel really proud of. And they're like, hey, I worked, on, I worked hard on these stories. These are um, really strong national security stories. And that, you know, in a perfect world, they're, they're even starting to make a difference that they're changing the dialogue around these topics. I think that's a high bar, but I think that's that's what we aspire to for for these. Um, I think that, you know, I think the, it's, like I said, it's going to be spread around the newsroom. I think there will be an opportunity to spend time in the Pentagon. There will be an opportunity potentially to spend time on Capitol Hill, um, you know, out on assignments. But um, I also think there's probably like some quick hit stuff. There's some, there's some, you know, I think, any, any job, there's things that maybe aren't quite as fun, but um, it is, we expect it to be a really good learning experience and we want people to be able to come in and kind of, um, you know, hit the ground running and feel like by the end that they've learned a lot about how, how a professional news organization works and, and that their writing's getting better. So, okay. Um, should we try and answer some of the questions that are coming in through the chat? Does that sound good, Devin? Yeah, that sounds good to me. Okay, so first question that came in was for Davis from Jovi. Does being a guardsman affect your reporting and is there a point where you would step away from a story due to conflict of interest? 
Yeah, so um, just to just explain a little more for everybody else, I'm currently an officer in the Army Guard. I'm I'm going on. Uh, I've got four and a half ish years of service right now. Um, the The way that we manage it is that um, you know when I'm in a Title Thirty Two or state status, my chain of command and any conflicts of interest stop at my governor and stop at the state of of which I'm a member of the National Guard. Um, you know, we've, we've got pretty hard and fast rules about, um, uh, on, on both sides of the coin, both in the newsroom and on the army side about me not using things like my, my CAC to access resources for news gathering purposes. Um, and, and, um, you know, whenever, whenever a story touches the state's national guard of which I'm a part, that's, that's where it's just handed off completely to someone else. I don't have any input on the process at all. Um, that's at you. Believe it or not, it's only come up once in the in the almost two years that that I've been here. Um, and and whether it kind of affects my reporting, um, I think that being somebody who's still in uniform part time gives me kind of more of a desire to make sure that my stories are putting, especially my accountability reporting is 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 something that would be good for my soldiers if they were in that situation. You know, I want to do right by the Joes and Janes on the line. And, you know, knowing, knowing the kinds of people who are in uniform right now and, and what they care about and what matters to them, um, I say gives me kind of a, kind of a, a soft edge when I'm out there on the beat. And then, um, you know, it's it's also sometimes a, a plus for my credibility when it comes to developing sources where I've got this shared understanding of of, you know, what's what's going on from a baseline perspective. Awesome. OK, and the next question was from Carrie. She asks, will there ever be a model for acceptance of paid freelance reporting and not just op eds? I'm not sure if you guys covered freelance at all. Yeah, we didn't we didn't talk about that explicitly here. I think we've done, you know, um, to be completely honest, I think we've recognized that that's one of the holes we have in our newsroom that there are stories we could be doing or missing for, you know, if a freelancer was available. Um, I think, you know, over the last six months, we've started to accept more freelancing from within the United States. I think there's been a, a long history of it internationally with defense news, but I think we've started doing more with military times in the last six months. I point to particularly stories um, in the education and transition section. Um, there's been a lot there. Um, you know, we've done a couple um, uh, on the ground pieces. I can think of probably three or four on the ground pieces from Ukraine um that we've used freelancers for um you know we in the interim while andrea is hiring right now we've used some freelancers to bolster our marine corps times coverage so um i i so the the short answer is like yes there is a model like i think right now it's probably a, a fairly narrow um window but i think with the right pitch um, we are moving to a model where we can accept more and more uh, freelance pieces and, and pay for them. We don't pay for op-eds, so that's um, one thing just kind of off the bat, but um, I, hope that, I hope that we'll be able to do more kind of going forward. I, I hope that answers the question. Awesome. Okay. And Kareem asks, how do you cover a beat for a branch and do you have to be DC area based? Um, let me ask, uh, let me take the second part of that and I'll let Andrea answer or in Davis answer the first. Um, we, uh, I would say right now we are putting a strong emphasis, like a, a very strong emphasis on having folks in the DC area. Um, I think there is, uh, you know, I think there's probably uh, a lot to be said for kind of trying to create a, a, a newsroom culture and we're trying we're trying to put a little bit more of an emphasis on that in person and um, often many of the topics and issues we're covering are 
primarily happening in DC. Obviously, some of our reporters are not in DC. Um, hi, Davis. Um, right now, but um, I think kind of for now, moving forward, we're we're trying to get folks into the DC area. So that's the second part. But um, Andrea and Davis, you guys can speak to the first about covering a beat. <laughs> I can start and let Davis clean up. Um, just from an editor's perspective, it's a little different. Um, Davis will talk a little more about the reporter's perspective, but kind of how it looks um, from my end, um, especially let's think about, okay, so we have a new hire. How do we start? How do we start covering the speed, especially if you don't have your sources built out yet? I mean, first of all, it's to meet those sources, right? So um, if you're in the DC area, you know, as we're trying to hire someone in the DC area, Quantico's right there, the Pentagon's right there, um, the Marine Barracks Washington is right there, Camp Lejeune is five to six hours, um, you know, so getting on base, um, start with the low hanging fruit, start with the public affairs officers. That's not where the best stories are. I will tell you a lot of times we get press releases um, and we do look at them. Um, we usually don't publish from press releases unless of course, you know, it was someone died or someone was fired. But I do think they kind of give tips sometimes to things we can cover, right? So if they're doing an exercise and it's new, like what is it, you know, that's actually happening in that exercise that we can kind of read between the lines and do some expanded reporting on, you know, this half a sentence that was mentioned in a press release. Um, we do get submissions, you know, if um, something easy as happening, people do reach out, um, social media. We try not to focus on just getting our main, you know, stories from social media, but sometimes things go viral. I'm thinking of um, Stu Scheller, if any of you remember him a few years ago, um, a year ago, um, you know, that, oh my gosh, a year ago, yes. Um, <laughs> it's been busier. Um, you know, that was something that originated on social media. Um, so, but it, it, it's just, it's starting to have those conversations and, and know what's happening. And then I think once you start to meet people, um, you can kind of have the questions, um, you know, you start, you start to understand what to ask and then you can start building up a FOIA base. You can start building up, you know, requests for data. Sometimes, unfortunately, those take months. So it's really building a steady stream of, you know, we don't necessarily need to get all the information right away, but what's a topic that we haven't you know, one that we're working on, just so you guys know, don't go tell everybody is, you know, marine aviation, there's a lot changing, like how, what is the new force design look like with marine aviation, let's get those numbers, let's talk to the marine commanders, let's know how many of those jets are flying, let's know how many new jets they're buying, you know, there's a lot of different data we can dig in a lot of documentation. Um, I will say one of the like, hardest parts and easiest parts of the job is is essentially the military. I think, um, you know, dealing with military officials can be very difficult, but it's also a lot of, you know, US taxpayers information, right? There's public information. We can use photos from divots. We can use, you know, we can do FOIAs. We can get the data that we need to get. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunities there, you know, can we, can we FOIA for some emails for this general who was fired and let's see what we can find. Um, and that's what I really like, the, the creativity and flexibility we have at Marine Corps Times is we can kind of go in all those directions as long as it's important to the Marine Corps and the service members. And then Davis, as far as the reporting side, why don't you finish up there? Yeah, uh, just a couple notes off the top based off what Andrew said. Um, I, I ended up having to cover down for Marine Corps Times and go out to Stu Scheller's court martial um, at, at Camp Lejeune last year. And that was quite the experience you know um these these papers especially on the military side are almost seen as kind of the paper of record for each branch and so if something that momentous is happening you know you're going to have a chance to go there you're going to have a chance to go there report from there you know be the be the person who does you know the the so-called first draft of history um and and there's a lot of ex excellent opportunities like that. Um, and then when it you know when it comes to trying to cover a beat, honestly, the hardest thing sometimes is just keeping tabs on all of the ongoing efforts and themes across a branch of the military. You know, um, Kyle, Todd, and I are two and a half people to cover a million man total army. Um, 
And, and sometimes, and sometimes just knowing what's going on can be really challenging. Hell, staying on people's email distribution lists can be challenging sometimes. So it's definitely something where beat reporting has vastly improved my ability to organize myself, organize my time, systematically approach the way that I develop story leads that I then see queries through to completion. You know, I've got I've got follow up Friday where every single PAO in the army knows that if they owe me something, they're getting an email from me on Friday morning looking for it. Um, you know, it, it it's just it's really things like that that um, end up you know, portending success in these uh, beat reporting roles. Okay. Sean also would like to know, um, since you guys just talked about freelance pitches, once you guys get that going, how should people format freelance pitches and to whom do you think they'd be directed? And likewise, if there's a story that people feel might deserve coverage, how do you prefer to receive story tips? Andrew, do you want to start there? Sure, um, I will let um, Mike talk about the education and transition freelance stuff, but as far as story tips, um, usually email and usually a follow-up email. I mean, if we follow each other on Twitter, actually Carrie, Carrie is, um, written a few op-eds for us and she's reached out and followed up via Twitter, um, which is helpful. But yeah, usually, usually an email to start. And, you know, if it is deadline day, I, I might miss it. So definitely follow up. But um, it doesn't need to be, you know, like, it depends who you're pitching. But for me, just tell me the who, what, when, where, why. You know, it doesn't need to be an elaborate six paragraph lead. Tell me what's going on and we'll know right away. Is this something that is in our wheelhouse or is it not? Um, and then we can come from there. Um, the, the best advice I got about pitching years ago was um, to keep it simple and kind of say, why you? Meaning like, why should we hire you to do the story? And why now? Like, why do we need to do this story right now? And I think that's, um, I think that's really good advice and the best pitch letters uh, do that. I'll tell you just, it, it may have been this morning, it may have been yesterday, but, but you know, I was talking about a, a freelancer from Ukraine. Um, the pitch was, very direct um it laid out like hey here are the people i'm going to talk to and here's what i expect they're going to tell me and here's what i think the nook graph will go is going to be and um you know hey if you want to do this get in touch with me by this date and here's my phone number and it was it was just very clear there were no questions and um you know it got a couple of us thinking like hey this might be a story we we need to take so um you know the I think this is one of the tough things about being a freelancer and I've done it for years myself is like you have to put a lot of time into those pitch letters and you have to make them compelling and you have to make just like how you would spend time making a lead that grabs a, a, a reader you have to make a pitch letter that that grabs a reader too. Um, and so um, I think, as Andrea said, any of us are kind of willing to take those, you know, we have a um, I think there. I don't think it's a secret. We have a, a news editor's account um, that's out there. I think it's, uh, I think it's just news editors at militarytimes.com, and that would go to um, the whole group of us. That's. I don't think I'm ruining anything, um, but I think that's probably the best place to start. And education and transition, though, those can go there too. They can come to me personally. we um, you know, and if you don't hear. Um, it's always good to, to ping us again. Like everyone, we get a billion emails, so things do get lost in the cracks. Great. Okay, well, we have two more questions and then we can go ahead and call it for tonight. Um, Kelsey would like to know, are you open to hiring someone who's not currently in DC, but who is willing to relocate? Yeah, I think, and I should have been clear on that. I apologize, but the, I think the key part is that we need people who are living in DC, like it does, like the relocation, um, you know, I talked about the seven folks we've already hired this year. I think three of them have relocated. So um, I think that's that's part of it. It doesn't matter where you live now, but it is kind of that willingness to relocate. Awesome. And then our last question for tonight, um, Scott would like to know, 
Since much of the talk leaned toward training folks to become journalists, is there opportunity for an established journalist with extensive work in both the military and the civilian arenas? Um, I don't know if, if Scott's on, but I, I'm sorry, I just don't understand the question. Like, is there is there room for training beyond just our youngest reporters? Or I think we have trying to say that um, he has experience already as a journalist and would like to know if there's opportunity with you guys for an already established journalist. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think we hire, you know, I think we've, you know, again, going back to those seven people we've hired this year, I think some of them have 10 years of national security experience. Some of them have zero national security experience, but 25 or 30 years of journalism experience. Some have absolutely no experience, but have done a couple of internships. So I think it's it's all over um, it's all over the place. But it's it's kind of looking for some of those characteristics that we talk about in the job descriptions. Um, that you know that that curiosity, um, applying that rigor to ideas. Um, you know that the you know one of the ones I really liked that Andrea added was um, maintaining. Um, maintaining objectivity and understanding the perceptions that come with objectivity. So um, all of those are, are great, but yeah, I think I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, there are very few folks that, you know, we're not open to, I think, you know, we want to, we want to see as deep of a candidate pool as we can. Thank you, Mike. No problem. Thanks, Devin. Thanks for organizing this. Thanks for everyone for spending an hour on um, on a Thursday night doing this. Um, I really appreciate your interest and, and I really appreciate you guys um, reading Military Times. And um, if there's anything else, uh, anything else you need, or, you know, I think our emails are out there and we're happy to try and answer questions. And I know Davis and Andrea feel the same way. And, and Devin, if there's anything else that comes in, you know, we're more than willing to work with you. Absolutely. Thank you so much to you guys for joining us for this. It was great. And then thank you as well to everybody who attended tonight. We had some awesome questions in the chat. Really appreciate it. I hope you guys have a great rest of your night.